I'm just the warm-up act. I'm Jane Harmon, uh, President and CEO of the Wilson Center, recovering politician. Uh, it's not a 12-step program. We need recovered politics more than we need me, um, but it's obviously made me sick. Uh, so uh, I'm delighted to introduce this program and to show off uh, uh, Richard Whittle, who has been a scholar here since uh, 2011, uh, even if we have to share him with a few other folks in town, like the Air and Space Museum, he has produced uh, something remarkable, and you'll hear about it in a minute. Uh, not very many people understand the real story behind the Predator, uh, but these two do. Uh, Dick Clark, uh, not the band leader, the, this is the real Dick Clark, uh, was something of a prophet on this issue, I know because I've known him for a long time, and he was right before most people, including me, uh, got right. Uh, we met during the Clinton administration uh, when I was, no, yes, when I served on the uh, National Commission on Terrorism. I think that's when I met you, uh, which was then chaired by Jerry Bremer, whom we were just discussing, L. Paul Bremer, who went on to become Viceroy in Iraq and other things. Um, at any rate, uh, back then, um, uh, Dick and Charlie Allen uh, at the CIA and others were putting out warnings about Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. So was our commission report, by the way. Uh, and on 9-10-2011, uh, Jerry Bremer and I had lunch uh, at a restaurant on the Hill bemoaning the fact that no one was listening. Well, they're listening now. Um, this book is uh, a, Richard Whittle's book, is a reckoning with our past. It also invites us to have a serious conversation about our values. Uh, back in 2011, uh, John Brennan uh, asked, uh, John Brennan, then the uh, security advisor to the president, asked to come over here uh, and talk about the legal framework around drones. He was the first administration official to reveal that we actually had a drone program. And uh, we continue that dialogue today, um, starting rolling back the videotape and moving forward. And just as a comment, my own comment, um, uh, I think that, uh, I don't, I, I'll be interested in the conversation. I think that drones have a place in our foreign policy, but a foreign policy that is drones plus don't do stupid stuff is a bad foreign policy. And our foreign policy has to be uh, much more broad gauged and include things like the advisors we're sending to Africa to cope with the Ebola uh, pandemic. I mean, these are parts of a American foreign policy that showcase what's good about us. So. Um, We'll hear more of a focus on this. This is exactly the kind of th thing that the Wilson Center does well. I'm very proud to be here, and I'm very proud of today's speakers. So next up is both of them. What happens now? Okay, Rick is first. Richard won, and then we have Richard the second in a moment. Okay. Heard. The room's kind of small, so I guess if I just speak loudly, uh, everyone will hear me. Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Madam President, for that kind introduction. Um, and I thank uh, all of you for coming today to uh, hear me talk about my new book, Predator, The Secret Origins of the Drone Revolution, uh, and to discuss with you and uh, Dick Clark, sorry, uh, some of the issues that revolution raises. Uh, first, though, I'd like to take a moment to thank Rob Litvak, uh, who gave me the chance to work uh, on this book here in 2011, which provided critical momentum in what was a five-year project. Uh, and I'm also very grateful to Rob and Mike Van Dusen, and of course to you, Jane Harmon, for uh, later making me a global fellow. Um, being affiliated with what is rightly known as one of the top ten research institutions in the world, uh, is a great privilege and a high honor, and I'm grateful to you for it. <clears throat> I'm also grateful to Dick Clark for taking part in this discussion today uh, because he's a rare individual in Washington. Uh, in addition to the 2020 hindsight that most of us think we have, uh, he's demonstrated uh, in at least one instance that I know of that he had 2020 foresight. And uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but I know we'll all benefit from hearing what he foresees as the future impact of the drone revolution. <clears throat> but first, let me tell you about my book, which tells the story of how that revolution began. It's a story of invention, and a story of politics, and a story of war, 
and the story of the Air Force, and the story of the CIA, and how all those elements combine to create the first weapon in history whose operators can stalk and kill a single individual on the other side of the planet from a position of ambush and total invulnerability, which is an awesome weapon. <coughs> As the uh, Air and Space Smithsonian Magazine noted in 2008, that made the Predator an aircraft that changed the world, and that's what led me to write this book. Drones have been around in one form or another since World War I and built in numerous configurations for a variety of missions. Uh, no matter what mission or configuration uh, they were built uh, for or in, though, uh, they were always just a niche technology until 2001 when the Predator was armed and rigged for global remote control. <coughs> but despite its menacing name, the Predator didn't start out as a weapon. And as I found in writing this book, the story of this drone that changed the world is as odd as the aircraft itself. Most of those who created it were equally unorthodox. Take the Predator's inventor, Abraham Karam, a former Israeli aeronautical engineer whom many people regard as a genius. Born in Baghdad in 1937, but raised in Israel, by the early 1970s, Karam was director of preliminary design and special projects. Uh-oh, I went too far, didn't I? That did not go far enough. Um, he was director of preliminary design and special projects at Israel Aircraft Industries. But after working on a drone decoy to fool Arab air defenses in 1973, Karim was inspired to strike out on his own and develop UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, as the experts prefer to call them. He immigrated to the United States, the land of opportunity, and like all great American inventors, went to work in his garage. Karam's garage was in Los Angeles. <coughs> uh, and in that garage, he built a drone demonstrator which showed phenomenal flight endurance. It could stay in the air up to 48 hours without refueling, which was 10 times longer than any other drone ever built prior to that. With Defense Department research contracts, Karam went on to develop a larger UAV for the armed services called the Amber. And it also had phenomenal endurance. But the military wouldn't buy the Amber, and a company Karam created to build his drones went bankrupt in late 1990. But thanks to some other unorthodox thinkers, Abe Karam's revolutionary ideas about UAVs didn't die when his company did. Those ideas were rescued, and Karam and his team of engineers were hired by a pair of brothers who had a genius for business to match Abe Karam's genius for aeronautics. Their names are Neil and Lynn Blue, and they're the private owners of the San Diego area company that built the Predator, General Atomics. And while they're now in their late 70s, they're both still very active and fascinating in their own right. In 1957, when the Blue Brothers were in their early 20s and still students at Yale, they made the cover of Life magazine by flying a small plane around Latin America during summer vacation. And as a result of that trip, after they graduated from Yale, Neil and Lyndon Blue established a banana and cacao plantation on the east coast of Nicaragua in partnership with the ruling Somoza family. For the Blues, that venture only lasted a couple of years, but it was the first of many that by the 1980s had made them uncommonly wealthy. Now, as the name suggests, General Atomics began as a nuclear energy company, and it still is one. But it got into the drone business after the Blue Brothers bought it from <coughs> Chevron in 1986. They had a number of reasons for thinking drones might be a good investment, but among their motives was a desire to help the Contra rebels in Nicaragua overthrow the leftist Sandinistas who had overthrown their former business partners, the Somosas, in 1979. The, the Blue Brothers' first attempt at a drone was a small aluminum kit plane <coughs> they tried to equip with a GPS-guided autopilot. Neil Blue's idea was that the Contras, or an ally of the Contras, <coughs> maybe the CIA, could pack the plane's nose with explosives and use it as a poor man's cruise missile against the Sandinistas. Neil also thought the military might use it to deter or, or defeat a Soviet tank invasion of Western Europe through the famous Fulda Gap in Germany. The military, though, was utterly uninterested in this first General Atomics drone, 
So Neil decided in 1991 to buy Abe Karam's designs and products out of bankruptcy for the bargain basement price of $1,850,000. <clears> As I say in my book, if necessity is the mother of invention, war is the mother of necessity. And wars created the necessities that gave birth to the predator and to key inventions that made it revolutionary. The war in Bosnia and the difficulty of finding Serb artillery that was bombarding Sarajevo in 1993 gave, the, gave birth to the predator, which was derived from a smaller, less capable drone Abe Karam had designed called the Nat 750. In 1993, the CIA bought two Nat 750s from General Atomics to use in Bosnia. In the photo at the bottom here, the man to the right is Abe Karam. The man to the left is Thomas Twetton, who in 1993 was the CIA's deputy director of operations and went to California to seal that deal on behalf of CIA director Jim Woolsey, who had known Abe Karam for years. <coughs> at about the same time, after talks with Jim Woolsey, Under Secretary of Defense John Deutsch created a program to develop a similar drone for the military. Deutsch was also unorthodox, and he stipulated that this new UAV had to fly within six months of contract award. To make that possible, he adopted an idea that his deputy, Larry Lynn, had come up with, a special rapid procurement method called advanced concept technology demonstrations. And in January 1994, the Defense Department gave General Atomics the first such contract. Abe Karam and the engineers he brought with him to General Atomics redesigned the Nat 750, and six months later, the new Predator made its first flight. <coughs> Another unorthodox character in the Predator story is a former Air Force colonel, now a senior civilian official in the Pentagon, whose given name is James G. Clark, but who much prefers his nickname, Snake. <coughs> Snake Clark is a bureaucratic operator who likes to play what he calls Pentagon poker. I'll see your three star and raise you a four star. And he's often done that on behalf of an equally unorthodox and secretive Air Force technology shop called Big Safari. I had never heard of Big Safari until I wrote this book, uh, even though I've covered the military for more than 30 years. But Big Safari was responsible for the key innovations that made the Predator the revolutionary weapon it became. Several of those innovations sprang from the mind of a techno scientist who wouldn't allow me to use his real name in my book. Snake Clark calls him the man with two brains. In the book, by mutual agreement, I gave him the alias Werner. When the Predator made its debut in 1994, it was just a platform for a video camera whose imagery was sent back to a ground control station, a NASCAR-style trailer at the time, and went no farther. But by 1998, but in 1998, Big Safari took charge of improving the Predator and by 2001, it was the world-changing weapon we know today. That happened to a great degree because of three innovations that Werner devised. First, he figured out how to stream Predator video live to the Pentagon and other command centers. Second, he mapped out a unique satellite setup to let a crew fly a Predator over Afghanistan from a ground control station in Germany rather, <coughs> rather than from the usual 500 miles away. And third, he, he modified that setup so that crews in the United States could fly armed predators over the other side of the globe. Excuse me. And this is the uh, same system that the Air Force has been using ever since. That's an Air Force slide um, to control drones yeah, at intercontinental range. As I explained in my book, though he wasn't involved on a technical level, Dick Clark was a driving force behind those last two innovations. Because Werner came up with split operations, as he called it, only so that an Air Force team and a ground control station at Ramstein Air Base in Germany could secretly fly an unarmed predator over Afghanistan in the fall of 2000 to help the CIA find Osama bin Laden, a mission Mr. Clark had championed. And that Air Force unit indeed found Osama bin Laden. Less than a year later, Werner invented what he dubbed remote split operations 
to give the CIA the option of using an armed predator to kill Osama bin Laden without the trigger being pulled on German soil. I explain in the book why moving the ground control station out of Germany was deemed essential. I also explain how Mr. Clark and senior CIA official Charlie Allen began pushing the idea of using an armed predator to kill bin Laden after they learned that the Air Force was already embarked on a project to put missiles on the predator for other reasons. At that time, the Air Force project was hung up in a dispute with the State Department over whether arming the predator would violate arms control treaties. But once Dick Clark got behind the project, that log jam was broken and the initiative gained steam. The Air Force conducted its first Hellfire missile test shot from a Predator on January 23, 2001, and in the spring and summer of that year, top CIA leaders warily agreed to consider, and I emphasize warily and consider, using this weapon to target bin Laden. And though today people accuse the CIA of being addicted to using drone strikes against terrorists, before 9-11 there was a great deal of unease at Langley about the idea of Director George Tenet controlling a military weapon in an operation that might lead to headlines such as CIA assassinates Islamic militant. Even so, Big Safari and a small cadre of Air Force intelligence officers spent much of the first nine months of 2001 preparing for just such a mission. Big Safari physically armed Predator 3034, which now hangs in the National Air and Space Museum, starting in January 2001 and tested it that spring starting with a ground test, then firing missiles at target tanks, and then firing them into a building the CIA had constructed to find out whether Hellfire missiles, which were built to kill tanks, uh, would kill Osama bin Laden if fired into his residence in Afghanistan. The contractor apparently misread the specifications, by the way, and built a sturdy adobe structure that bore little resemblance to the mud and wattle houses of Afghanistan. So the testers nicknamed it Taco Bell and hung this sign on it. <coughs> they were in a hurry at this point, and so to help measure the Hellfire's lethality inside a building, they had to dispense with the usual mannequins filled with ballistic gelatin. Instead, as you can see in this slide, they used plywood silhouettes and watermelons to simulate people. But while Big Safari and people at lower levels in the CIA were getting prepared to send the armed predator after bin Laden, Dick Clark was having trouble getting the Bush administration to focus on the threat he and others saw in Al-Qaeda. The Bush National Security Council held its first meeting to discuss sending the armed predator after bin Laden on September 4th, 2001. I'm not sure how well you can see the details in these Google Earth photos. But this is the Langley campus of the CIA on September 12, 2001. The inset shows a double-wide mobile home that was put there to serve as the Air Force Predator Team's command center. That small white rectangle next to it is the ground control station that was brought from Ramstein, painted white, and parked next to the double-wide trailer on Labor Day weekend 2001, just before that September 4, 2001 National Security Council meeting. <coughs> But at that meeting, neither the CIA nor the military wanted to take responsibility for pulling the trigger on this new and rather exotic weapon. So they decided to wait. One, day to the, uh, one week to the day later, of course, everything changed. And the day after that, three armed predators were on their way to a rugged base in Uzbekistan where they could take off and land for missions over Afghanistan. Predator 3034, bearing no markings at the time and controlled from that little trailer park at the CIA, launched the first Hellfire strike in Afghanistan on the first night of the war there, October 7, 2001, an event I describe in great detail in my book. My book also offers what I believe to be the most accurate account to date of the Predator's role in the death of Mohammed Atef, Al-Qaeda's third-ranking military leader and Osama bin Laden's trusted friend. A couple of weeks after Atef's death, President Bush gave a speech to the Corps of Cadets at the Citadel in South Carolina, where he said, before the war, the Predator had skeptics because it did not fit the old ways. Now it is clear. The military does not have enough unmanned vehicles. I think that's when the drone revolution began. It's also a good place for me to stop so that we can get to our discussion 
But before I do, I'd like to offer you a couple of statistics. As 2001 began, the entire U.S. military owned a total of just 82 unmanned aerial vehicles of three types. The Predator, still unarmed at that point, and two other small reconnaissance drones. A Pentagon study issued five months before 9-11 estimated that by 2010, the military might own as many as 290 drones, but still only three types. When 2010, in fact, arrived, the military owned nearly 8,000 drones of 14 different types. An estimated 80 countries are now working on drones of their own, and the rapid proliferation of civilian drones raises its own set of safety and privacy issues and has outstripped the Federal Aviation Administration's ability to regulate. Yet we, as a society, are only beginning to debate the questions uh, that this drone revolution raises. And, and figure out how we're going to cope with it. Uh, from the wisdom and efficacy and legality of targeted killings to whether we ourselves are safe from drone strikes that might be launched by terrorists or other nations. In addition to playing an important role in the events that created this new technology, Dick Clark addresses such questions, that's not his, in his adept new thriller, Sting of the Drone. <coughs> um, and I suspect he'll be happy to talk about them with us now. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rob Litvak. I'm the, the Wilson Center's uh, Vice President for Scholars. Uh, and I direct international security studies here. It's a pleasure for me to uh, uh, chair this discussion uh, following on from Rick Riddle's uh, excellent presentation. I mean, Rick, Rick's book, I mean, the, the drone issue is on the front page of every newspaper. This is, I think, the first sustained serious historical look at sort of how the genesis of this program. I think that speaks to the mission of the Wilson Center, which is to try to provide historical, essential historical context for today's pressing public policy issues. So I think Rick's done a, a marvelous job in this book and really provides a valuable service. We're fortunate to have with us today as sort of as a commentator, uh, Dick Clark, who kind of lived through these events. And I guess I would open by asking Dick to comment on, on Rick's uh, opening presentation, having kind of lived through the events uh, in a variety of positions, what your reflections are on the, the the history development of this program. And we'll, we'll turn later to uh, kind of where we are now in terms of the, the current uh, crisis with ISIS and, and the agenda. <coughs> well, first of all, I want to thank the Wilson Center for holding this event and thank Jane Harmon for all the good work the Center does. Um, it is seldom that I read a book uh, about that period in history without having a lot of quibbles. Uh, and I read Rick's book and I have nothing, no, no objections. It's spot on. <clears throat> it is the most complete and accurate and I think impartial uh, account of some really key decisions that were made over that period. From my perspective uh, at the time, this was not a decision about technology. It was part of a decision, a policy decision, uh, about whether or not we should kill people. Uh, and that, that in retrospect now, of course, seems like a trivial decision uh, since we're killing people all the time. But at the time, it was a, it was a major policy decision. Uh, coming out of the, the Nixon era scandals, uh, we had a, an executive order signed by Gerald Ford saying that the CIA could not engage in political assassination. And that had been the barrier for a long time about using lethal force in non-war situations. And the decision that we had to face in 1998 and 99 was, do we reinterpret that uh, to take out terrorists, particularly Osama bin Laden, before they could do damage to us? It was a very tough call. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, I remember an argument that went something like this in the Situation Room. Hey, <coughs> you mean to tell me, you group of lawyers, <coughs> from various departments and agencies, that I can kill Osama bin Laden if I send a cruise missile at him, but I can't kill him with a, with a bullet. And when it, when it was boiled down to that question, 
uh, it became clear that the policy didn't exactly make sense because what the lawyers were driving us to uh, was that we had to find bin Laden and then either send in an airplane, uh, which had all sorts of disadvantages, uh, or fire cruise missiles, uh, which we had tried a couple of times and had all sorts of disadvantages and basically didn't work. The problem was that we could never find bin Laden and the leadership of Al-Qaeda and have them stay there long enough to get killed. They moved <coughs> a lot. Uh, and so we asked Charlie Allen uh, and um, Admiral Fry from the Joint Staff to deal with this problem, come up with options. What could we do? Should we have special forces that on call that would parachute out of the sky whenever we found bin Laden? What could we do? And they came up with, uh, well, first of all, let's see if we can find him and fix him in real time through a predator. And it wasn't an easy project to get approval even to do that. Uh, CIA said no, DOD said no. The White House seldom orders departments what to do. Uh, we ordered them to do it. And in that experiment in the fall of 2000, <coughs> we found bin Laden. Uh, quite stunning to be sitting in <coughs> a trailer in the CIA parking lot at 2 o'clock in the morning and know that you were looking at bin Laden live and you knew where he was. Um, and quite amazing to me to say to the guy sitting next to me in the parking lot at 2 in the morning, can you go a little bit to the left <coughs> and realize that 10,000 miles away or 12,000 miles away there was something in the air that was going a little bit to the left. Uh, we realized then that what we needed was to arm it. And the Air Force was going to do that eventually in the fullness of time. Um, but we didn't have a lot of time. So with the assistance of General Johnny Jumper uh, of the Air Force, we compressed that uh, program, uh, proved that it could fire hellfires, which everyone said it couldn't, uh, <coughs> and then had a uh, weapon system that we could offer up uh, to get bin Laden now in the new Bush administration. Again, CIA and, and the Pentagon refused to do it. And the meeting that Rick describes on September 4th was pretty acrimonious uh, because they refused to do it. And it was obvious we were going to have to take that decision to the president. The decision didn't get to the president in time. Uh, and on September 11th, in the evening of September 11th, uh, in the Situation Room in the White House, the CIA announced that it was going to send in the predators as though it was their idea. <coughs> The, the history then is pretty much what you know until the Obama administration. Uh, and the Obama administration uh, changes the Bush policy, which was sort of reluctant use uh, of predators, particularly in Pakistan. Uh, and Obama and his counterterrorism advisor, John Brennan, turn up the predator program remarkably. Uh, and use it extensively uh, in both pa Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Libya, uh, Yemen. Uh, and the question that I think we should discuss in a bit is, did they overdo it? Uh, and did, uh, did they rely on that too much as a substitute for other things? Uh, did they overdo it in the sense that the predator itself became an issue rather than an instrument of policy? Um, since then, they have dialed it back down, uh, and the president gave a major speech at the War College uh, last year uh, talking about his new guidelines and his new criteria uh, for use. Uh, it took a while for those to kick in, but I think they clearly have kicked in, and the result is that the predator is being used much less right now. Uh, we'll talk in a minute, I hope, about what happens next with, with uh, unmanned vehicles, because well, the policy issues uh, that we've touched on so far are only the tip of the iceberg of the policy issues that we will face in the, in the next few years. Well, thank you, Dick. Let's, let's pivot exactly to where you'd, you'd like to go. To, um, as, as Jane mentioned, stated in, in her opening here, this, Rick's book is a challenge, not only a challenge to reckon with our past and with our values, but to also take into account where this instrument fits into the broader context of U.S. strategy now. 
uh, as she put it, drones and don't do stupid stuff, that do not constitute a strategy. This is uh, the most, a very public dimension of U.S. policy. It's a thorny one uh, because it does raise questions about our values, about, uh, as uh, a Georgetown professor put it up on the Hill, the ability to kill anyone anywhere in the world with kind of, uh, you know, legal justifications that, that uh, have not had full, borne full, full scrutiny. It also raises issues that Rick deals with in his book of, of how within the United States government these issues are addressed and sort of the militarization of the CIA and the extent to which the DOD is becoming an intelligence operation. So sort of with that as, as sort of, uh, with that as context, let's turn to the current uh, engagement with, uh, with ISIL um, uh, in, in the regional context there, and the, um, there are, are manned aircraft participating in the air operations, but one suspects that over time to have this loitering capability that was so one of the revolutionary aspects of the drones that it will be used uh, even uh, more extensively. How do you see uh, the drone component fitting into the broader uh, uh, theater of, co of, of engagement in which the United States is, is, is involved? Let's start with Rick. And yeah, well, uh, thanks, Rob. And, and I think that uh, what's happening now in Syria, uh, I know that uh, drones are playing an important role. Uh, I think, in fact, the, the military, I just read a piece today saying that the military is worried they don't have enough. Right, right now, there are 139 predators in the Air Force inventory on 165 Reapers. A Reaper is a larger version of the Predator that can carry four Hellfire missiles and two 500-pound bombs. Um, they're being used mainly in what the military calls intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance because, in fact, while the Predator has been an important weapon uh, for the CIA in recent years, for the military, its, it's, uh, its pivotal value is the fact that it can loiter over a battlefield and look at what's happening, give commanders a bird's eye view, follow people, watch people for long periods of time. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Predator and Reaper have flown uh, since uh, the period we talked about in the book, 2.5 million hours, uh, most of them in combat, but uh, they have fired fewer than 4,000 weapons, which, which means that, in fact, 99.24% of the missions have been non-lethal because most of them are military and most of them are for ISR, as the military calls it. And that's the role that they will be playing, I think, more and more as this campaign against ISIL or ISIS, however you prefer to call it, goes on because um, uh, as the uh, ISIS fighters uh, seek cover, uh, disguise themselves, melt into the civilian population, uh, following, looking for them, uh, using ISR will be more and more important. And in the end, precision strikes will be very important because the Hellfire missile has a 20-pound warhead, uh, and it's a much smaller explosion than a 500-pound bomb, and so uh, it, it could prove to be an, a very important weapon as this campaign goes forward. You know, in a certain respect, um, looking in sort of an arc of, of history, the, the Predator is sort of an extension of precision-guided munitions, which have kind of increased targeted lethality, you know, compared to, you know, uh, the 19 World War II experience where extensive area bombardment was used with you know, thou tens of thousands of civilian casualties from the Vietnam War onward. Uh, precision guided munitions came online. This is now wetting precision guided munitions with an unmanned vehicle that can loiter for extensive periods of, of time. So in terms of the kind of memorial uh, uh, issues of proportionality and you know, just uh, use of force, etc., the targeted aspect of it was initially viewed as a way of being kind of engaging in more just military activities by focusing just on the individuals rather than area bombardment, et cetera. In the ISIL war, there, are, there is a leadership within ISIL that presumably is, is, is being targeted, the con their command and control. One of the critiques of uh, the air campaign so far has been that They've used very expensive ordnance and, and platforms to go after pretty low-value targets like uh, uh, SUVs and, and some captured uh, 
military vehicles that, that the Iraqi army deserted, raising the cost of whether the, 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 I've seen the billion dollar figure cited in the paper, whether that billion dollar cost of the air campaign up to now justifies the, this, the use of the, the expense of these, of, of these weapons, you know, the Hellfire being the price tag that it has, et cetera. So could you, you know, just address that aspect of it, sort of the use of the drone in the current <coughs> strategy, taking into account that uh, there's a lot of debate about what really our objectives vis-a-vis -vis ISIL are, contain it or really kind of degrade and, and, and roll it back. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to get into a critique of the, of the air war uh, in Syria and Iraq mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's, it's a little too early for that. It does seem to be a rather half-assed air war, to be tr truthful. Um, but uh, that may be a premature judgment. Um, <laughs> I really think that we could uh, do with a few B1 sorties, but uh, that's another issue. The, 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 the benefit of, um, of using unmanned aerial vehicles is, as you say, um, the, the loiter time. And that allows far more uh, precision, and it should, properly utilized, result in much lower collateral damage. If you think of the alternatives back in 2000, 2001 that we had, we could send in a B-2 uh, at 500 miles an hour that would be over the target for a second. Uh, we could launch uh, cruise missiles uh, that would be, uh, we, that we could not guide after we launched them. Uh, in those days, you launched the cruise missile and it went, and you couldn't talk to it after you launched it. That's no longer true, but it was true then. Uh, the beauty of the Predator, uh, we thought at the time, was that we could stay up for hours uh, getting what's called a pattern of life, being sure that there were no children in the building, being sure that we had the right building. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Air Force and the CIA today, when they have a target, will very often uh, be over it for days before they pull the trigger so that they really establish a good pattern of life and really are highly confident that when they pull the trigger, they're not going to be hitting the wrong person. Uh, no other weapon offers that. Uh, and so for people concerned about human rights and, and, and law of war, uh, peop people concerned about the, uh, the dysfunctional uh, effect of bombing, uh, this is actually a better weapon than the alternatives. Uh, and uh, as I say in, in my book, Sting of the Drone, I have characters who uh, I couldn't have done what Rick did with a, a nonfiction book. It's just, it's way too much work. Uh, <coughs> so I did a, a, a thriller version of it. But I, I, have, um, I have characters, you know, saying in the book, is what you really object to killing people uh, or is it the predator? And that's a, that's a fundamental question which I think people need to ask. Uh, it's perfectly all right to say, no, I object to killing people in Waziristan. I think that's dysfunctional, counterproductive. That's a perfectly valid point of view. I, I don't agree with it, but it's a perfectly valid point of view. But to say, yeah, I'm okay with killing terrorists in Raqqa, uh, uh, in ISIS, uh, but I don't want to use the predator because I'm afraid of collateral damage. That doesn't make sense. Uh, the only weapon we have that has this level of control and minimization of collateral damage is a drone. It's absolutely the only weapon that can, can do it. And as you mentioned in your initial comment, uh, you know, the threshold question is the determination of whether to go after an individual or not. The drone itself is the platform for doing it, and you've alluded to the advantages that it has over others. It has one other advantage that I, that I want to mention. Uh, and this should seem obvious, but at times it, 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 it's glossed over. When we send piloted aircraft into a theater, we have the risk of a down pilot. Uh, because of that, whenever we send piloted aircraft into a theater, we pre-deploy enormous combat search and air rescue capabilities. Uh, helicopters, uh, special forces, that would go in and get a down pilot. If a down pilot is ever captured, one guy, one person, uh, that immediately becomes a cause celeb in the United States. Uh, we're like Israel in that regard. We can't lose one person. And the enemies know that, and they make a big deal out of the fact that they have one, one American. 
So policymakers are sometimes deterred from using piloted aircraft because they don't want to run that risk. Uh, and the beauty uh, of the drone is you can shoot it down and the pilot will go home and have dinner with his family. Thank you. Comment from Jane Harmon, who I worked on these issues. Th I did. From, from her help Funding her these issues yeah. and building the drones in my aerospace uh, district in California. I think the, the, the comments raised by both of you are really interesting. Uh, I would suggest a reality check, however, by watching the first episode of Homeland uh, called The Drone Queen, uh, which is uh, fictitious, but actually shows that uh, drones can make, uh, that as careful as we are in targeting drones, we can also make mistakes. But I want to ask about something else. Last time I looked, I think 70 countries have drone technology, and five of them know how to make armed drones or will know how to make armed drones. So we're not in this alone. And the assumption that this is an American weapon and we can control its future, good or bad, is false. And in, in some near term, uh, uh, bad uh, nations we don't like, plus possibly non-state actors, will have drones. Uh, and how does that complicate this picture? And second part, P.S., the FAA has now said that U.S. domestic airspace can be used by drones, uh, both and to some extent law enforcement drones, uh, but also private sector-owned drones. Think Amazon bringing your, you know, your books to me tomorrow morning. And uh, what opportunities does that pose for mischief? If let's imagine bad guys trying to case our country uh, uh, become the people who take over these private sector drones. That's a great question. And just a hyperlink to another topical uh, story. We had an Air Force fellow here with us last year, Jane, who talked about a potential drone, drone threat to the White House uh, in terms of the various threats that they have to, to, to think about there. Yeah, so could I, could I yeah. uh, address some of those things? Um, I think uh, Dick has a, a, a scene in his book in which um, the uh, CIA officer, a woman who is actually running the drone program, is killed by a model aircraft uh, that a terrorist has rigged with explosives. And actually, I think that, yeah, he's, I said he has 20, 20 foresight. But uh, I, I think uh, uh, that, that that is actually the greater threat. And, and that is, of course, just a terrorist weapon. I mean, uh, uh, drones like the Predator are large enough uh, that it would be quite difficult for another country to use them against us on our soil. And the communications architecture, which I describe in the book, is quite complicated and expensive. You know, it's not like subscribing to satellite TV. You, uh, you, you have to have fiber optic cable to keep the latency and the signal down to a certain level, et cetera. So there, there, there may be a couple of countries in the world who might be able to uh, duplicate that communications architecture. Uh, but even if they got uh, a, a drone like the Predator, and the Chinese have built one. They have their knockoff called the Pterodactyl. Uh, it looks exactly like the Predator. Uh, even if they could find a place to uh, launch the aircraft from and set up the communications architecture, uh, I'm confident that our air defenses would find and knock that, that aircraft out of the air pretty quickly. And one Air Force general told me, the, you know, the Predator is a flimsy thing and it flies at 82 miles an hour. Uh, an Air Force general told me the easiest way to shoot it down is to fly next to it in a helicopter with a 12-gauge shotgun. <laughs> <coughs> so, so I think actually, though, but, but you're, the, the, the point you made uh, is correct, that the smaller drones, these new drones, uh, I think are more worrisome uh, if, if used in the wrong way. So, Dick, you, you, you told me before the meeting that fiction is harder to write than nonfiction, but you've addressed one of these scenarios in, in, in fiction, but it's based on uh, your kind of real-world experience. How do you see the future of drones as Jane sort of framed it? Well, I think modern air forces, uh, the top 20 or 30 air forces in the world will have them. Um, they already have them now for reconnaissance. They'll have them armed. Uh, I think the Russians and the Israelis already do, and I think the Russians and Israelis have already used them armed. Um, and we saw Hamas using one uh, during the recent fighting uh, with, with Israel. Not an armed drone, but a... Uh, uh, Hamas released drone video, uh, so I, I think non-state actors are going to going to have them too. 
Uh, and this, this does sort of lead to the proliferation of drones when everybody can have one. Uh, I'm hoping for the price to come down a little first. <coughs> but um, we're now seeing weddings filmed by drones. We're seeing real estate uh, companies using drones, uh, movie companies. Hollywood has been given permission. Uh, there's a real concern, you're right, with the Secret Service uh, that have... <coughs> I don't want to go into too much detail, but there's a real concern there, as you can, as you can well imagine. Um, I think that the, the issues for the use in the United States uh, are A, privacy, uh, and that's unaddressed because it turns very frequently on state law um, and city law. Uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, home of the University of Virginia, has banned drones. I don't know what right they have to do that under any federal law, but nonetheless. Cities around the country are, are trying to pass their own ordinances. We need a federal approach to this uh, on the privacy issue. Uh, and then we have a safety concern. These things can't see each other. Uh, and they, they cannot see what's back here uh, unless they're constantly twirling the camera, uh, which they typically don't. The, the, the normal drone pilot sees what's ahead of him and what's below him. Uh, and that's okay when you're flying over Afghanistan, where there's not a big air traffic control problem, typically. Uh, but it's not okay if you're flying in the United States. Uh, one of these things is going to hit something. One of them al already just missed uh, a commercial jet in Florida, a passenger jet in Florida. Uh, we shouldn't wait for it to hit a, a passenger jet. Uh, we should say, look, I know it's going to make these things more expensive, and therefore maybe the Real estate people won't be able to afford them, but they have to have avionics on them that announce where they are uh, and have collision avoidance. Uh, right. sense, sense and avoid technology. Yeah. We have uh, uh, about 10 minutes left in the session, time for a few questions from the floor. Uh, I'm going to recognize in the back our Air Force fellow, Don Cloud, Colonel Don Cloud. Uh, yes, uh, my question uh, pertains back to your uh, point on policy and other implications of drones. As was mentioned, the uh, drones are going to proliferate. The only question is how that happens, if it's homegrown, organic, or uh, you know, our country has a long, rich history of military-to-military -military cooperation in regards to the sale of weapons. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to what you think the most important questions we should be asking in regards to the United States policy, policy question on whether or not, and if so, how to sell armed drones to our friends, allies, partners. Well, I used to make those decisions when I was in the State Department, and people can make them overly complicated. Um, we've already sold a drone to Turkey, the UK, and Italy, and I think the UAE is in line for one. Um, basically, if you'd sell them an F-16, you should sell them a drone. I don't, I, I, I don't see the difference, um, and other people will sell them. Uh, as Rick mentioned, the, the Chinese drone is an exact copy uh, of the Predator. Yeah, surprise, surprise, you can guess how that may have happened. <coughs> uh, so, no, I, I don't see that uh, as an issue. What the, the, the problem, I think, gets to when drones are allowed to think for themselves. And the Navy drone, which is the X-70, X-47B, I knew he'd know, <coughs> was originally designed to think for itself. Uh, now, the Pentagon rules don't allow that, uh, and so they've turned off that feature set. Uh, but the aircraft was designed to be launched from a carrier in a swarm, perhaps, uh, and the swarm would talk to each other, and they would be pre-programmed. If you see a ship that looks like this, or an airplane that looks like this, kill it. Uh, and in a war, you know, maybe you want to do that. Um, <clears throat> short of a war, uh, that gets to be a really bad decision because then we do really have killer robots. Uh, and my friend Bill Maher, I think, coined the term flying killer robot uh, for drone, and I think it's because of that mentality from science fiction movies and whatnot, you know, the robots that are going to come and kill us, that a lot of people have a negative reaction uh, to drones. Drones to date are not robots. There is a human in the loop. 
uh, but the technology has already been invented to make them flying killer robots, and that is a big policy decision. Well, given the mistakes that have been made even with manned systems, like the shoot-down of the Iranian Airbus the, by the Vincennes, it's a really thorny and, and problematic area. Other questions before Ambassador St Stapleton Roy, distinguished scholar at the Wilson Center. Uh, thank you for the fascinating uh, presentations. As drones proliferate, and more and more countries and perhaps non-governmental organizations get hold of them, and they are used in various ways, responsibly or irresponsibly, one can anticipate that there's going to emerge a need for ground rules, uh, some sort of international concepts that establish whether and when it's permissible to operate without permission in national airspaces of other countries and to take potentially lethal actions. We, in the case of air defense identification zones, for example, never bothered to do that. And so you have irregular practices in the world that are complicating our foreign relations because we accuse other countries of doing things which our allies do uh, and there, there are no ground rules because we're talking about international airspace. If we can anticipate the need for that, when should the United States try to take the lead in setting up rational ground rules for using these things? Well, Steve, that's a good question, but I, I can't imagine what that negotiation would look like. Um, and you and I have both, you and I have both been at a few negotiations, and I, 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 that's not one I would like to have to lead. Um, I can't really imagine uh, us taking the lead. I think we'd be laughed out of the room. You know, it's a bit like us taking the lead on uh, offensive cyber uh, international norms. Uh, I think somebody else is going to have to do it. You may remember, in the case of the chemical weapons uh, ban, uh, we knew we couldn't take the lead, uh, and so we asked the Australians to, and they did a marvelous job. Uh, so maybe, maybe something like that, where one of our uh, trusted allies, who's a bit more uh, well-liked around the world uh, and has a bit cleaner hands, could, uh, could take the lead. we we'll take one more question, and then we're going to adjourn the there's uh, books are, are for sale out in, in, in the lobby. Uh, Jim Shear, who is a public policy scholar at the center and just left uh, uh, the Department of Defense, so I'm sure he has a perspective on these issues. Thank you, Rob, and uh, colleagues for a very stimulating presentation. Uh, formerly DOD, and as a recovering practitioner, I promise to use drones uh, as a noun, not a verb. Um, I had to remind people a lot about that in the last four years. Glad that the issue of fully autonomous warfare has been addressed. Michael Walser, among others, has raised concerns about moral agency if it's a really autonomous yeah. weapon. But I want to also ask about the issue of remoteness. When you've got a targeting team that's very remote from the battlefield, are there some command issues? I know of at least one case in Afghanistan where we had U a U.S. unit negotiating with a bad guy and the bad guy got hit. And the criticism was the intel community had great intel but poor situational awareness. And so I'm wondering whether the issue of remoteness, the yeah, person in the loop is excellent, but are there issues of command responsibility downrange that, that we need to wrestle with? Yeah, I mean, on your map, uh, Rick, you showed Creech Air Force Base in, the, in, in Nevada. And, and uh, Dick alluded to his experience in, in a trailer at Langley. You know, I mean, there is that aspect of, of operations 10, 12,000 miles away. And, and um, presumably, the person uh, making the left turn is not the person also deciding whether to, to fire or not. Right. Maybe you could operationally talk about that aspect of it and address more broadly the kind of the remoteness. Uh, it's not robot killers, but just very remote control kind of killing. Well, I, I uh, uh, command and control and coordination of uh, drone operations was a problem on the very first night of the war in Afghanistan. One of the stories that I tell in great detail in the book is how uh, the Predator was following uh, Mullah Muhammad Omar, the Taliban leader, uh, and uh, might have been able to kill him, but uh, General Tommy Franks in uh, Tampa at Central Command Headquarters 
and uh, General Chuck Wall, the Air Operations Commander at the Combined Air Operations Center in Saudi Arabia, and the people on the sixth floor at the CIA and the people in the trailer at the CIA uh, had a lot of trouble communicating and, and argued uh, endlessly over what should be done. Uh, and uh, I won't try to go into any more detail, but, but it is in, indeed uh, can be a problem, particularly, I think, coordinating uh, when the CIA and the military are, are trying to work together. We now have a dozen bases in the United States, actually, uh, that are controlling uh, armed drones or uh, unarmed global hawks uh, around the world. Uh, the Air National Guard bases, a lot of members of Congress have found that a great way to save their Air National Guard base is to change it from a fighter plane base or a, or a transport plane base into a drone operating base. Uh, and so the, the remoteness is, in fact, uh, a difficulty. I mean, as someone who spent 30 years in the newspaper business, I can tell you that communication is difficult, especially when you're in the communication business. And, uh, uh, you know, so, so there, there will always be need to, to work on that. Um, on the, the robot killer aircraft question, uh, yeah, that is, that's one reason that a lot of people in the military object to the term drone, because it seems to imply that that it's robotic. But as Dick said, in, in fact, uh, uh, there are pilots and sensor operators controlling the aircraft, and they're taking orders from commanders who are right there with them. There are a lot of humans in the loop, actually. Dick? Yeah, I, I think if you're, if you're using a drone <coughs> or a remotely piloted vehicle, as the Pentagon likes to call them, um, if, you, if you're using a drone in the theater of operations where there are Americans on the ground, mm -hmm then those Americans have to be in the communications loop. Uh, I think people may have an image that there are two or three people sitting there in, in a trailer somewhere at Las Vegas, uh, Creech Air Force Base or something, and making the decisions. The decision is made with a lot of people on the communications link. Uh, and more lawyers are on that communications link than you would possibly believe. This is, after all, the United States government. And uh, another former public policy scholar, Mark Mazzetti, who wrote a marvelous book here, The Way of the Knife, had an article last year about the dispute between there was an individual in Pakistan that was a target, legitimate target, but they couldn't sort out whether it should be done by a CIA drone or a Department of Defense drone, which is sort of emblematic of where we're at on this. The book is Predator, uh, copies available for sale in the, in the lobby. A marvelous uh, accomplishment by Rick Whittle, we're proud to have as a global fellow. His book is a representative example of really kind of what uh, this institution does the use of history as a tool of public policy analysis. We're grateful to Dick Clark for uh, participating in today's events, for Jane Harmon's participation, teeing up the issues uh, in her introduction. So thank you all for attending today. Please join me in thanking the speakers for an excellent presentation. Thank you.